What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in today's episode is Joshua Landis. Joshua is the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma and a widely recognized Syria expert who was brought up in Beirut and has lived over 14 years in the Middle East. Joshua was last on the podcast over three years ago to discuss what was then an ongoing invasion of Northern Syria by the Turkish military and the long-term ongoing withdrawal of American forces from the Middle East and Central Asia. Today's conversation picks up where that episode left off, with the background this time being the ongoing negotiations between Turkey, Russia, and Syria concerning President Erdogan's stated desire to expand Turkey's military presence in the north of Syria, to create a larger buffer zone in which to transfer Syrian refugees, and to protect Turkey from the threat of Kurdish national independence. We may be on the verge of seeing a reset in Turkish-Syrian relations, and a rapprochement between President Erdogan of Turkey and President Bashar al-Assad of Syria. The implications of such a reset would be profound for the Syrian people, and is further evidence of Turkey's bid for strategic autonomy and reflective of the emerging geopolitical complexities of the Middle East and Europe, exacerbated as they've been by the war in Ukraine. This was a fascinating conversation. We spent the first hour focused mostly on the historical antecedents of the conflict in Syria and the larger American presence in the Middle East. And we devote the second hour to assessing long-term prospects for Turkey as a regional power, the role of the EU and NATO to serve as counterbalancers to Turkish aggression in the Aegean, and prospects for normalization of relations between Turkey and Syria, and what that means for the U.S. and Russia long term. If you want access to that part of the conversation, and you're not already subscribed to Hidden Forces, you can join our premium feed and listen to the second half of today's episode by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. All of our content tiers give you access to our premium feed, which you can listen to on your phone using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners, you can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io, and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. And with that, Please enjoy this incredibly timely and informative conversation with my guest, Joshua Landis. Joshua Landis, welcome back to Hidden Forces. It's a pleasure being with you. It's great having you back on the podcast, Dr. Landis. So I was telling you that I had a chance to re-listen to our conversation from 2019 when you were last on the podcast. That was right around the time that Turkey initiated an invasion of northern Syria that Trump greenlighted. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today, probably in the second hour, will be a continuation of that conversation, given what has been in the news and the potential for a deeper incursion by Turkish forces or a possible reset between Ankara and Damascus. So I encourage everyone to go back and listen to that because it really was one of my absolute favorite conversations and the analysis of the conflict in Syria was really on point. But before we get into any of that, And our focus today, which is going to be on Turkey, Syria, and the new geopolitics of the greater Middle East, I'd love if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this field. Sure. I grew up in Saudi Arabia and Beirut, Lebanon. My father opened the first American bank in Saudi Arabia in 1958. Citibank had a branch in Jeddah. So I grew up in Jeddah. Then we moved to Beirut when I was only four years old, but I grew up in Beirut till I was 10. Left Beirut and our family returned, or I returned, excuse me, after graduating from Swarthmore College to teach at International College, which is a high school related to the American University of Beirut. So I taught there for two years. It was the middle of the Lebanese Civil War. And that really, it sparked my interest in the Middle East. I started learning Arabic. I tried to figure out why people were shooting at each other and where the divisions were in Lebanese society. Then I applied for a Fulbright grant and went over the mountains 
to damn you, the University of Damascus. And I spent a year in the dormitories there in, at University of Damascus, Wahd al-Ula. And that was the year of the Hama uprising, 1982, when the Muslim Brotherhood took over the fourth largest city in Syria, Hama, and the regime, dominated by Alawites, a different religious group, surrounded the city and they bombed the hell out of it, mostly with artillery and tanks. And it was a prelude for the civil war that we're seeing today and that broke out in 2011 because it really pit Sunni Islamist forces against this secular, soi disant secular Alawite regime. And all of the divisions in Syrian society that were present then really came out in the big uprising 2011. So then I went to Harvard and Princeton, did a PhD on Syria at, the, at Independence. I've been teaching at University of Oklahoma for the last 20 years and started a center for Middle East studies here, a center for Iranian studies, which I head as well. We've raised quite a bit of money. We have a good Arabic program, good Persian language program, and quite a few professors of Middle East studies here. So that's been my life's work is building up these centers. But I also was writing from 2004 on a blog called Syria Comment. And that got me a lot of, you know, it really boosted my profile because almost immediately tons of Syrians began to come to the blog, comment, write on it. It became a clearinghouse in Washington and many other capitals around the world for all matters Syria. Today, I'm not as active on it because the civil war made it very difficult to have a nonpartisan conversation or an intelligent conversation about Syria because everybody became so angry, partisan, and bitter during the civil war that it was very difficult to have a, a real discussion without it turning into vituperative insults. And so I've stepped back from that quite a bit, but for over 10 years, I wrote, moderated almost every day Syria comment, which just was consumed me. And I write in foreign affairs and other policy journals today, but I'm less active and Syria is in a very difficult and bad place right now. So that's my trajectory. I've been a Syria person for, you know, for 30 years now. Yeah, it also seems that Syria was top. We, we always do this in the U.S., right? We have, I mean, because the U.S. is a global, you could call it a global hegemon it, or an empire in some sense. And so like geopolitics and adventurism and foreign conquest and military interventions and what's going on in the rest of the world are part of our daily news digest. And so whenever the U.S. is involved in one way or another in a conflict abroad, as has been the case in Syria, that country features prominently in the news cycle in the U.S. And it does seem like ever since the invasion of Ukraine, the conflict in Syria has fallen off the radar of people's attention. Would you say that that's correct? And how has the war in Ukraine diverted resources and attention away from the war in Syria insofar as concerns America's involvement? and the orientation of its allies and partners in the region. Oh, absolutely. Ukraine has completely eclipsed Syria, no doubt about it. America is focused on Ukraine. Everything is to do with Ukraine thinking first. And then, of course, the pivot to China, which is going on underneath this, the anxiety about China. Today, everybody in Washington, all they want to do is talk about great power conflict, China, and of course, Ukraine. And Syria has really been largely forgotten, even though the United States has at least 900 military troops, lots of other personnel in northeastern Syria along the border with Iraq. We still occupy 30 percent of Syria and we control the oil of Syria. So that, and we're denying it to the Syrian government and to most of the Syrian people. So they're extremely poor. We're, we're, America is monstrous in the lives of Syrians. But for Americans, Syrians don't count today. So one of the things that um, I want to do at the top of this conversation is to kind of frame what I think is kind of most interesting or relevant in this conversation. And it's something that we did talk about in our previous conversation in 2019, which is the breakdown of the rules-based liberal order and the emergence of this new multipolarity as a result of just geopolitical realities that face the U.S. and its 
ability or inability to maintain that order. And the Middle East is a really interesting area because one, it has, as you mentioned, longstanding political divisions, I guess stemming largely from the fact that it's been the land of empires and nation states are really an artificial construction. And so you have these nation states that sit on top of these fractured ethnic lines. Kurds are a great example of this. They straddle at least three countries, Turkey, Syria, and Iran, and Iraq, actually, four countries. Right, four countries, right. Four countries. And so it's also interesting when you go back to the Iraq war and how truly stupid it was. It's hard to really understand how the administration at the time thought that it would be a good idea to go into Iraq, not just Iraq, the plan was Iraq, Syria, Iran, break these very authoritarian governments that presided over fractious ethnic demographies and institute pluralistic democracies, which would rely on ruling consensus to actually sustain and maintain governing majorities. I, it's actually kind of ridiculous. And I, I always go back to, to the, the Iraq war as the, the beginning for a lot of these fractures, even though much of what we're going to discuss today and the multipolarity is more recent. It seems like 2003 was a big part of what led to the beginning of the break with, between the US and Turkey. You're absolutely right. Because the Middle East was in a nation building phase, let's put it that way. Because after World War I, the Ottoman Empire was broken up, multi-religious, multi-ethnic. And these borders were tentatively inscribed in the Middle East. A lot of people, of course, resisted them in the beginning with pan-Arabism, pan-Syrianism, all kinds of different. They didn't like Israel, the Palestinian refugee problem. So they were all contested. Now, as time went on, those borders became more institutionalized, more internalized in the minds of Syrians and Iraqis and so forth. But breaking those dictatorial governments apart, of course, did not lead to democracy and power sharing as America forecast it could. It led to a very bloody ethnic and religious civil war in each of these countries, and a one that America could not control with forces way beyond the control. Invading Iraq in 2003, I think, is clearly the single most disastrous foreign policy decision that the United States has made. It really cost the region and the United States tons of money and lives. And then we compounded it in Libya, Yemen, Syria. And when you look at the, the outcome of those wars, you see that states that were inimical to the United States, that had sided with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, they've been crushed, they've been smashed. And this leads a lot of people in the Middle East to question America's motives. You know, were they really trying to advance human rights? How could they be so stupid? A lot of people in the Middle East don't believe that America could make those kinds of mistakes honestly. They believe that America is too smart and that they did it intentionally. You get this big conspiracy theory notion that America is just out there to destroy its enemies. But it does make you wonder, and clearly America's very fractious foreign policy elite. There are liberals, there are conservatives, there are people who just want to take down these governments because they're enemies of the United States. And there are other people who, who are motivated by foreign, by human rights issues. So it makes you question why, you know, why have the enemies of America been so badly destroyed? You know, it's worth mentioning also that in the last 30 years, since the end of the Cold War, America has intervened in other states about 130 times at a much faster pace and often with more military force than it did either during the 40 years of the Cold War or in its entire history since 1776. I America's think we did. We had 105 interventions in the course of the Cold War, wasn't it? Rough, something like that, 100? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it, the pace increased at the end of the Cold War after the Soviet Union fell, and which makes you wonder, makes you question, why? Why would America intervene so much more once the Soviet Union collapsed? And because we don't have a major threat to the homeland. No power is strong enough to threaten the United States. 
And I guess a realist would say that's happened because America can do it, because there is no challenger out there. America doesn't have to hesitate before entering into a country like Iraq. And I think 1990, our war against Iraq was a real turning point because we were very anxious going into that war. Congress almost voted against it. We were worried that a lot of American troops would be killed like they were in Vietnam, where we did have great power uh, escalation. But it turned out in Iraq that there was nobody to challenge us. The Soviet Union was prostrate. They voted, in fact, for our entry. They had to because we were going to lend them money. If they wanted to borrow money from Germany and the United States, they had to vote yes in the UN for that intervention. And China did too, because Tiananmen Square had just broken out. So America was so powerful. We could get the whole world to vote with us and we could take down Saddam Hussein with one hand tied behind our back. It really wasn't a war, it was a takedown. 200 American soldiers were killed and most of that was by accident. But we devastated the Iraqi army and that, that was a game changer for the United States because it changed our whole attitude from the anxiety of a Vietnam quagmire to we can take these states down and we can do what we want on the world stage. So it led to a period of unipolarity for about 30 years and to, I would say, a sort of hubristic American sense of being able to shape the globe in a, in a way that, that seeing nations as plastic, that we could get in there and really change them for the better. At least the left thought we could, and the right perhaps just wanted to take down people who were enemies of the United States. And so you, you had those two instincts working at the same time in places like the 2003 invasion of Iraq or in Afghanistan that led to, I think, a lot of extra suffering and, and some bad policy choices. Hmm. I remember that time. I was very young. I would have been like 10 years old, but I do remember a cover of Time magazine with uh, an American soldier going off to war and his girlfriend or his wife hugging him. And you had that sense of anxiety. You could feel that anxiety in the culture. Right. And to your point about how it exercised the, the ghost of Vietnam, I also remember watching a comedy skit years later by George Carlin, where he talked about that war. And he, you know, he yeah. talked about George Bush's famous words, this will not be another Vietnam. So it's interesting because you know things have changed so much since then. I wanted to bring it back to the framing that I started the conversation with, with which is um, that I think you know we've been living under this more or less stable equilibrium led by American hegemony and the quest for full spectrum dominance. And what it seems like is happening now is countries have come to the realization that this is an irreversible trend. We're past the point of trying to decide whether or not the U.S. is committed or capable even of maintaining the order and now firmly in a phase where competing nation states are trying to gain better positioning within a new, more dynamic equilibrium. And what's so interesting about Turkey is that it has so much to gain and potentially much to lose from the changing order, depending on how things shake out and depending on the choices of the country's leadership. And Ankara knows this, and it's exercising a greater degree of strategic autonomy. Turkey is a member of NATO, but it's also developing independent bilateral relationships with countries in and outside of the region that the U.S. and its allies aren't too happy about, Russia being the primary example. So when I look at what's happening now on Turkey's border with Syria and the potential resetting of relations between Ankara and Damascus with the support of Moscow and against the wishes of Washington, I feel like we're watching that new multipolarity playing out. And I'm curious, one, how will you see that framing if it resonates with you? And what it means for the various regional players involved in the Syrian conflict, including the Kurds in northern Syria, and how you see it all playing out? Well, I think you're absolutely right that the U.S. has gotten to a point where it no longer has, it's no longer good for the U.S. to be staying in Syria, largely because Turkey is furious this has been a major irritant in a relationship between Turkey and the United States. Why? Turkey, big country, Anatolia, 20% of 
Turkish citizens are Kurds, an ethnic group that's different, different language. They speak an Indo-European language related to Persian rather than to Turkish. And they have one small-ish group within the Kurdish spectrum in Turkey is the PKK or the Kurdish Workers' Party led by a man named Ocalan who's in jail in Turkey. But that group has been driving for a great deal of autonomy, if not independence for Kurds and Kurdish nationalism with a dream that Kurds will have their own nation state, not only in Eastern Anatolia, but in Northeastern Syria, Northern Iraq and parts of Iran where Kurds live. And Kurds often say that they're the largest ethnic group that's been denied a nation. So there's this national desire for self-determination amongst the Kurds. Not all Kurds, but an important part. And there's been an insurgency in Turkey that's gone on for 40 years. And the Turks always say it's led to the killing of 40,000 people. Now, most of those people are dead Kurds killed by the Turkish army, but it's been very disruptive to Turkey. So Erdogan uses it to bind the nation together to win elections, but it's also a major concern of Turks that the country could break up. And America has been very solicitous of the Kurds. If you recall, in 2003, when we invaded Iraq, America wanted most of our US forces to enter Iraq, not from Kuwait, where they did enter, but from Turkey and to come in through the north where the Kurds resided in northern Iraq and were allies to the United States. Turkey, a big ally of ours, was supposed to say yes and facilitate this, NATO and so forth. They said, no, we're not going to do that because you're going to give the Kurds autonomy and this is going to spark greater desire for self-determination amongst Turkish Kurds. And it's just going to ruin the entire region. And so they said no. And there were American officials who began to talk openly about carrying out a coup d'etat in Ankara in order to overthrow the Turkish government that was denying us access. You know, Turks just saw this as American arrogance and they got furious. And Erdogan was one of the more furious of them. And he's held that sense that, that of American high handedness. And then again, when we went into Syria, originally, we got we cur encouraged Turkey to take the lead in Syria in 2011 when the civil war started. It, Obama said, we will lead from behind. We need a local power to really get involved because we don't understand. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do another Iraq. But if Turkey wants to take the lead, we'll back them up. So Turkey did take the lead. They thought erroneously that they could turn Syria into a country led by the Muslim Brotherhood, an Islamist group that would be allied with Turkey, just like the Islamist Erdogan and the AK party in Turkey, and that they could turn Syria into eh, not a satellite, but a very friendly, dependent ally. That of course failed, but America, instead of sticking with the Arab rebels that Turkey was supporting, that America supported for many years, got spooked because those Arab rebels, the Sunni Arab rebels, became increasingly Islamist and Al-Qaeda and ISIS became loomed large. And it looked like those would be the two groups that would benefit from the fall of the Alawite regime in Damascus. They would take over Damascus and rule Syria as an Islamist emirate or caliphate. So America switched horses in the middle of the stream. We abandoned the Arab allies that we had motivated and armed, and we sided with the Kurds. 10% of Syrians are Kurds. They live in the north along the Turkish border. So America began to train, the group is called the YPG. They're related to the PKK in Turkey. Turkey and Erdogan see them as terrorists, America, of course, is designated the PKK as terrorists. But America said, well, this wing of Ocalan followers in Syria are not terrorists. They're different. And we're going to support them and arm them. This infuriated Erdogan and infuriated the, many of the Turks. So they accuse the United States 
of arming, supporting, paying the salaries, and building up a military force of Kurds that in the long run want to hive off about 25% of Anatolian Turkish nation and turn it into a, an independent Kurdish state. So they see this American effort as a dagger pointed at the heart of Turkey. And that's been the main friction point between the United States and Turkey for decades now. And that's why Erdogan has turned to Russia to a large degree. It's not the only reason, but it's one reason. And really become, you know, many people in Washington say, Turkey is no longer our ally. It shouldn't be in NATO. There's a big, you know, there's a big kerfuffle about this in, in DC because we can't understand why Turkey is so furious. But that's because we're arming the Kurds and the YPG in Northern Syria. And so it's a manifestation of how countries that were allies like Turkey of the United States have now grown into being regional powers of their own. And they're beginning to see the world in a much different way. And they're wanting to balance America with alliances with countries like Russia and China. And they don't want to play the game of American hegemony. And they're making a lot of money by doing this uh, because they can benefit from discounted Russian oil. The whole Russian banking system is trying to put its money in Turkey. Turkish oligarchs who took their yachts out of Europe went to Turkish coast. So Turkey can be on both sides and get the best price by walking back and forth. And a lot of countries are doing that, are following suit. India, you know, you just go down the line, Brazil, so forth. So this isn't the, you know, Turkey is not the only one, but they're feeling their oats. And this is part of the move towards a multipolar system away from American hegemony. And America's going to find that the environment out there is much more difficult. We saw Saudi Arabia do this mm. just a few weeks ago with a visit of China's leader. So it's not just Turkey, it's happening on a much broader basis. Yeah, that's also interesting bringing up Saudi Arabia because I was just thinking about it because Saudi is such an interesting case. It's a country that's had long-standing security ties with the United States going back to the 30s. And yet it has independently moved away from the United States and towards Russia and China, building better relations with them. I think primarily because it doesn't feel safe ideologically, if you want to use that term, right. in the American orbit because of this. Again, now this, I don't know how to describe what I'm talking about here, maybe you can give me the words for it, but this strain of thinking in American circles that became the dominant ideology around democracy and exporting democracy during the Bush years. And this has kind of pervaded all administrations since. And I'm not entirely sure why it has continued to dominate thinking in Washington, because it feels like we've unnecessarily antagonized foreign leaders and foreign regimes in part because we have this obsession with their internal ruling dynamics and whether they're democracies or authoritarian countries, something that we didn't do during the course of the Cold War. I'm curious what role that plays here and how you would frame that. Yes, I think I'd frame it just the way you've done it because in a sense, Biden had a choice. He could frame the Ukraine war in the way that George Bush, the father, framed the 1990 Gulf War, which was, as you recall, in 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, its weaker, smaller neighbor, and tried to take it because it wanted all the money and the gas. And the United States said, no, you can't do this because it's a small, vulnerable nation, and we have to stick up for the sovereignty, national sovereignty. So rather than being ideological, it was international law. We're the rules-based order. Rule-based order. In Ukraine, Biden could have framed it in the same way, which would not have alienated China and dictatorship, you know, monarchies like Saudi Arabia in the same way, and said, you know, you just don't invade your small neighbors. And we're going to stand up for this because the UN is behind it and so forth. But instead, he chose to go back to the Cold War, in a sense, and to frame this as evil empire, the evil Putin and democracies, the free world versus the 
enslaved world, dictatorship, the world of dictatorships. And that, of course, for countries like Saudi Arabia or even Erdogan, that spooks them because they could be next. And they saw the heavy hammer of sanctions, which is really a new, it's not entirely new, but it's been used rather profligately by the United States to really hurt their enemies. And it's become a much more powerful tool in the hands of the United States because the banking system is so much more integrated today that we can really crush countries through economic warfare. And it spooked countries. And so it's been, in some ways, I think Biden sees it as a good way and the right way because it's forcing Europe back under the American security umbrella mm. and for them to be subordinate to US leadership once again through NATO and through the fear of Russia. And as we recall, you know, many Europeans, certainly Macron and Germany, began to think of Russia as the European power that could be integrated into Europe. And they could build a European army, which Macron was calling for, to replace NATO. The NATO was brain dead, as he called it. And we were going to get rid of American breathing down our necks. And we we're going to be with Russia. And we're going to have our own energy sources and so forth. And of course, that world exploded. You know, I, I see you shaking your head, but that world exploded. That dream exploded when Russia invaded Ukraine. And it's still, the trouble is, it's still not over. Mm. Macron in Washington was beseeching Biden, don't prolong this war. We've already taught Russia the lesson. It's been badly hurt. We know it's not very powerful. We spanked them. Let's make peace, right? We're not going to give the Ukrainians all that they want. And then Europe can go back to a better economy. And they don't have to live under this American hegemony. And I think many Europeans are thinking that way. And they're beginning to see a prolongation of this war. America's recent 50, almost $50 billion fill-up to the Ukrainians as a uh, as sort of an anti-European move, because Europe's going to become smaller. Mm. It's totally dependent on the United States for energy. Its economy it is suffering. Who's going to want to invest in Europe if there's a war going on like this, refugees, 7 million refugees. But if this war goes on, there's going to be a lot more million refugees. So in that sense, I think you're absolutely right. This puts America, America isn't the dominant power it was 30 years ago in terms of economy. It's going to be very more difficult. And China and Russia are very different than they were under the old communist party. They're capitalist forces today, and a lot of countries want to do business with them. And those countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Brazil, India are powers on their own. They can stand on their own two feet. They don't need America the way they used to. So it's a very changed environment, and America's going to have a bumpy ride. I would love to try and pull on some threads in the the Eurasian part of this conversation, even though I was kind of starting it, taking us down the road of Turkey and Syria. But right. let's talk about this a little bit because I think there's so much confusion in the public discourse around the Ukraine war, the role of the US, the role of the Europeans, the, the nature of the regime in Russia, what you were talking about and what we were talking about with respect to democracy and what role democracy plays as a kind of rallying cry for American foreign policy. Just on that point for democracy, I think it's actually an interesting point to pull out. I do think that it's important that the United States has a clear and defensible identity wrapped up in its foreign policy. I think that's something that it's lacked yep. since the end of the Cold War. And not having that, I think, has led to a lot of disasters. I have been personally against this idea of looking publicly lambasting the Saudis or the or Putin or going after these different regimes for this high-minded moral rhetoric, which you know pisses them off. It doesn't just you know affect them institutionally. It pisses off the leadership. And it's caused a lot of resentment in Saudi Arabia and Moscow, in China and elsewhere. But I do think that I have supported the idea of framing the war in Ukraine in part as a defense of European and Western democratic liberal institutions right. and societies, because I do think that 
Ukraine being taken over. Look, and this is the other problem with this conversation, Joshua, but I would love to try and have it because I think many people are correct in assigning some portion of blame to U.S. foreign policy for the mess that we've gotten in with the Russians. But that doesn't excuse the Russians for invading Ukraine. And I do think that Ukraine is a very important country to defend. And I think Ukraine is hugely different. The, The Russians invaded Ukraine. The U.S. didn't invade Ukraine. The U.S. invaded Iraq. So arguments that criticize the American foreign policy in Iraq have no bearing on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right. One, can you just address that first? We can kind of go one by one because I wrote out a few notes when you were giving your answer. How do you view this, this war in Ukraine, the way in which factions of American society typically associated with the right and with the left view it, how they don't quite get it right, and what really matters here that we should focus on? Well, the cost matters. And it does, as you've laid it out, I think very beautifully, it, it pits principle against the human cost. And what does it really mean for us? This war could go on for a long time. And the Ukrainians are demanding that we fight it until the Russia is expelled from all of Ukrainian territory, as well as the Crimea. Those are objectives which I think are a bridge too far, way too far for the Europeans but probably too far for the Americans as well. And because, for the Russians. Oh, definitely for the <laughs> Russians. <laughs> and, and I don't think Russia is going to do that. I don't think in order to eject them from Crimea and so forth, America would have to up the firepower tremendously and probably get its own troops involved or NATO troops involved. Because the Ukrainians, it's not clear the Ukrainians can do this, even with a lot of advanced machinery. And we have to remember that we're paying Ukraine has no tax system anymore. We're paying for every soldier out there. We're paying the salaries of the government. We're paying for everything. The infrastructure rebuilds. So we're on the line. I don't know what the grand total of is that we spent in one year's time in Ukraine, but it's got to be well over $100 billion, probably closer to $200 billion. And we have no idea how much of that is stolen lost, whatever. I mean, there's got to be a ton of corruption. There's tons of corruption. And it's going to be, of course there is, because people are suffering in a terrible way. But that's going to get to be a trillion dollars pretty quickly if it continues, just the way Iraq and Afghanistan did. It's not cheap to fight Russia. And of course, you're killing a lot of Ukrainians and Russians in the process. And the infrastructure of the nation is being destroyed increasingly. And when do you pass, you know, when does the efficiency surpass the amount of good that you're doing. And America's goal in this is to teach Russia a lesson, right? Where, yes, we want to liberate Ukrainians, but ultimately that's the human rights part of it, sovereignty part, but ultimately we're trying to take Russia down several notches in order to make sure that they don't invade anybody else and that they're going to follow American leadership in the world and the UN and and international law and fall in line with this, you know, what we call the rules-based order in the world. So we have very different, ultimately we're gonna have very different objectives than the Ukrainians. Because in order to satisfy most of our objectives, we do not have to liberate every inch of Ukrainian territory. And that's gonna become a problem. And we saw it already with Zelensky's visit to Washington DC where you know, everybody put on a good face and said, yes, let's go after the Russians because we still want to go after them. But at some point, Americans are going to get tired of that. And they're going to say, you know, let's sit down and talk a deal with the Russians. And then that's going to be a moment of real difficulty for many Ukrainians. But perhaps many Ukrainians will, by that time, will just say, you know, we've had it. We want to go home. We want to rebuild. We can't get everything we want. But I think the Europeans want to stop the war at a much earlier point than the Americans do. And the Americans will want to stop it at an earlier point than the Ukrainians do. Certainly than Zelensky and and the people who support him do. So let's talk about Europe a little bit, because when when you were giving your initial answer, a few answers back, you talked about how the Europeans are already wanting to end the war. And I think that one of the uh, challenges that the Europeans have is that they, or they have been at least, very unrealistic about their vulnerabilities and how much they rely on the United States for for their security. I think one of the benefits of this invasion is that it does begin to push the Europeans towards reckoning with that and trying to figure out a way to be 
more independent and living within their means from that standpoint. Because I guess the thing is, I don't believe that Russia can be, quote, part of Europe. It certainly can't be part of it Europe institutionally because it's going to dominate it. And I'm curious to, to hear what you have to say about that. So from a security standpoint, that doesn't seem to make sense. Neither, of course, does this sort of overly antagonistic policy of the Americans towards Russia. I don't quite know what the path is for the Europeans diplomatically and economically because they're so dependent on Russian oil and gas, particularly gas for their industry and for consumer purposes, but they're also very vulnerable to Russian intervention. And at this point, especially because of the last couple of decades where US policy towards Russia has been very, I mean, again, I don't really, I never really understood that. I never really understood why the US had such a hard on for the Russians, especially after the Munich conference in 2007. You know, I don't really know. I don't have a good answer to that. You know, in a sense, we've all made a mistake, not only the Europeans. The Europeans made a mistake in believing that Russia had become more European and could be part of a European army, that they could buy their gas and build these gas pipelines to Russia without losing, without becoming totally dependent and, and being blackmailed by somebody like Putin. And they made a big mistake. There's no doubt about it. The Germans made a big mistake. The French, everybody had a big wake up call. But America is not blameless in this world. We made the same mistake with China. You know, for 30 years, we believed that letting China take over Walmart and eviscerate our industrial capacity was okay. We even integrated critical military supply chains with Chinese heavy industry. I mean, we went full tilt. We did because we thought <laughs> that they would be integrated into a, a globalized world. So our vision of the globalized world in which China would become a carbon copy of America and would play by the rules-based order and that they would just all become little Americans was the same dream that was driving Europe to open up to Russia and build those pipelines. So we're all trying to feel our way in the dark a little bit. And we put down, you know, once the communist systems in China and Russia moved away from the ideological straitjacket of communism into this sort of state-run capitalism with an autocrat, we thought, you know, that's enough. We can do business. We can open up our borders and we can, but it's been wrong and we don't know how wrong and we're all feeling our way forward. And how we're going to deal with China, Taiwan, and all this, you know, all these new alliances we're building in order to contain China and trying to rally the free world around this new, it's all a bit of a mystery. And it's very anxiety producing because, of course, you can see how many things can go wrong because things have already gone wrong. The Ukraine war has been very brutally wrong for Europe, but the whole China debacle has been wrong for the United States. And Biden has just, you know, made this new move where he said that we will defend Taiwan. And Americans don't know how much do we really want to defend Taiwan in the same way that the Europeans are asking, how much do we really want to defend Ukrainian sovereignty? And those parallel questions are really will define the world order and how we answer them are going to define that future. It seems that the strategy, and please correct me if I'm wrong here or if you don't agree with it, but it seems that a core part of the strategy for the U.S. going forward is to empower key allies or countries that it feels it can have a productive relationship with to build security in various regions of the world that are crucial. And the two, those two regions are obviously this kind of mix between the Middle East and Europe, and the primary threat there is Russia. But the big one is China and it, and countries like Japan, for example, which are picking up more of their domestic of their defense spending internally. It seems that the good thing is, from a European standpoint, that while there is no European country that can play the role of a Japan, I don't think Germany is that country. The European Union is a structure that doesn't exist in Asia. In other words, there is this kind of supernatural structure in Europe and these institutions that can allow for cooperation. It seems that Turkey is another one of those countries that the US may eventually throw more of its lot in, in that part of the world. Would you agree with that? And how does this entire, everything that we're talking about here factor into this country, which is has some of the best demographics in the world. It has a very large and well-funded military. 
It has a, a very key geostrategic positioning. How do you see Turkey's role in all of this? Well, I think Turkey is a key ally. It's key for our influence in the Middle East. We And Turkey is at a crossroads today. There's going to be elections coming up in a year's time. Erdogan is up for elections. Now, he just arrested his main competitor. He didn't arrest him, but he, he accused him. There's a court case against him for aiding and abetting Turkey's enemies, speaking badly about Turkish statesmen. So he has been knocked out of the race, which is obviously really undermines any democratic hopes for this next election. But Turkey was a central player for the United States, Ataturk, who became the George Washington of Turkey after World War I and re-knit Anatolia together and created the Turkish Republic, was a sweetheart of the West. He was secular. He pushed Islam out. He led Turkey towards democracy. He was the darling. Now, once Erdogan comes to power and has been in power for now 22 years, he has taken Turkey away from that secular stand towards a much more Islamist. And for a long time, America thought, oh, you know, Turkish Islamism is actually good. He's undoing the power of the military in Turkey. He broke the sort of Kemalist leadership of the Turkish military and has replaced it with one that's much more favorable to him. And we thought he could be really a model for the rest of the Middle Eastern countries to bring them towards democracy, but a Islamic infused democracy that would be more palatable. But of course, that, that has turned out to be, you know, Turkey's thinking on its own. It's got its own national interests. And Erdogan has really, really uh, ensconced himself in power and is turning out to be one of these populist dictators, not unlike Putin and China and so forth. So we're, we're very worried about where Turkey goes. But Turks want to be part of the West. You know, if you look at the New York Times, Turkey is part of Europe. If you look at the UN, Turkey is part of Europe. It's not a MENA, Middle East and North Africa state when you, you know, go to search for something on Turkey. It has worked extremely hard to become a part of Europe. And many Turks feel that affinity to Europe. And we have to remember that about probably well over 40% of Turkish DNA is Eastern European DNA and Greek and from north of the Black Sea. It's not from the central plains of Asia or from the Middle East. So Turks are, you know, ethnically at every level, they really do have a split personality, if you will. They are partly European and they are something different, uh, Middle Eastern. And so Turkey, I think America should not turn Turkey into an enemy. I guess that's the long and the short of it. We need to play a delicate game. We need to woo Turkey, which is one reason why I think getting out of Syria for the United States would help tremendously in repairing relations, certainly on a popular level, with Turks. They want to be part of Europe, and we should play to that element in the Turkish cultural arena. So I want to talk about that in the uh, second part of our conversation, Joshua, and let me throw out a few things that I, I'd like to talk about. One, I do want to discuss the prospects for peace in Syria between the Turks and Damascus, between Erdogan and, and Assad, because I think something that you have said, and you said this in our previous conversation, and that makes a lot of sense to me, is that the US, and we know this historically, has it can only commit so much to its various partners and countries in the region. And a perfect example of this is Afghanistan, where we committed not just money, but lives and reputation to building a, quote, democracy in Afghanistan. And in the end, we not only left the country, but we left the country in a way that left everyone significantly worse off than they would have been if we had simply put in the time to actually have a proper exit. And I wonder if that's not something that we should be discussing with the Kurds. And here, there are many parties involved, the Turks, the Iranians, Damascus, the Russians, the Ukraine war complicates this further. And so I want to kind of cap that conversation off and think about what are some possible solutions there, what we might see 
in terms of the Turks' involvement, again, in northern Syria. And I also want to talk about, continue this conversation about Turkey and Europe, because while I agree with that overall framing, and of course, the Europeans in some ways shunned the Turks, in some ways also understandably, because again, this kind of brings us back to our conversation about democracy and the needless way in which we've antagonized authoritarian countries, but also the importance that democracy plays in formulating our own sense of identity and the importance of identity in generating cohesion, whether that's cohesion right. of foreign policy or whether that's domestic cohesion. And Europe needs to have borders one way or the other, and it needs to figure out what those borders are, whether they're at the Dardanelles, whether they are in uh, Eastern Anatolia, so or the Levant or some area there. So they, I understand the, the challenge. I don't think it's as simple as, oh, the Europeans are racist and didn't want the Turks in. And as a Greek citizen, I, of course, supported the entry of Turkey because I think that has always been a, a big bonus for Greece's internal security, which is at risk with this kind of more strategically autonomous Turkey. And that's the other thing I wanted to bring up and talk to you about in the second hour, which is what do we make of Turkey's Erdogan's rhetoric, but also the large nationalist factions in Turkey, which seem to support more antagonistic rhetoric towards Athens? And what Absolutely. about Greece's ability to maintain the territorial integrity of the Eastern Mediterranean, especially in this age where gas and energy rights and exploration rights have, are becoming more valuable, especially to the Europeans? And that last point, just to throw that out there, is also the reliance of the Americans on Turkey seems to be dependent also on how much the Europeans can get their act together. Because if the Europeans can be a stronger force, they're also going to push back against Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean. So those are just some thoughts of, of where I would like right. to kind of take this conversation in the second hour. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Joshua, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of this conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Joshua, stick around. We're going to move the second hour of our conversation onto the premium feed. Excellent. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.